Hello Kindred Longevity Lifestyle Designers, this is Govan Your Secrets of Longevity.com. I was just interviewed by three friends, Will, David, and Matt, and they have the Primal Wisdom Bliss River podcast. Uh, you should definitely check out their Facebook page below, but also if you want to hear the full interview, it's about an hour long, you can check it out below as well. And this is just a 10 minute segment where we talk about some ideas around diet, also mineralization and also some scientific uh, ways of understanding uh, the information you're taking in and what's the best way to disseminate and decide what it is you're going to integrate into your life. So without further ado, here's the podcast. I often say there's four broad areas you should look at when exploring a new facet to your lifestyle, um, whether it's diet or exercise or any part of it, if you're looking for the optimal thing, is that you want to look at the research around something, so the, the studies that have been done, whether they're correlative or in the lab. Um, you want to look at the physio physiology of what's happening. So if, for example, 20 years ago, you understood that there's no biological mechanism for uh, healthy cholesterol to be deposited in the arteries, you'd have a hard time believing the studies that were saying that's what happened because you know Physiologically, it's possible for that to happen. It's oxidated, oxidated cholesterol that gets deposited there. Um, so there, there's those two points. Then there, there's the uh, factor of looking at past groups of people, so our ancestors or different cultures and the results they got. That's very. That's obviously not scientific because you can't have control. So you know, one group that lived a long time in this area of the world might have been doing something else that you're ascribing to their diet. But uh, we can still get inspiration and broad generalizations from them. Yeah. People... What do you think about like just experimenting? This is kind of what all three of us have done just mm -hmm. over the past, I don't know, three and or four years. Yeah, I was, I was just about to say like the fourth thing that I, I'd say to look at is your personal experience. So you have mm -hmm. to experiment. You have to do what works for you. Mm -hmm. So you can take into account those three things, the – the scientific research, the actual nuts and bolts of physiology, which is reductionistic. You don't want to focus too much on that, of course, because that can lead into problems. But mm. that combined with the looking at other cultures and past cultures and even, I guess, paleo diets and the ideas behind that is heavily focused on that to so try to figure out what our ancestors ate. And then your personal experience, like if you followed something that worked well in all three of those areas – but it just wasn't working for you. You can't keep doing it if your health is failing because of it. Right, right. Um, so we wanted to ask you about the um, the the pH myth because that's that's one of the biggest arguments that um, vegans kind of promote, like that that we sh that our bodies should be that our blood should be more alkaline and that we should be conscious about the pH of our blood. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well. Um, there's a lot of people who have come out kind of showing the science behind this. I don't have all the studies in front of me, so I couldn't get too specific. But the what I think a lot of people have, just like anyone who changes their diet, that has a beneficial result, whether they go on a pH diet and claim it's the change in pH that does it, or whether they're going raw vegan from a typical diet and they claim it's benefiting them. Anytime you make a change especially a drastic change, you're going to experience some change within yourself, whether it's subtle or a, a big sort of healing crisis type thing that leads you to better health. Um, but that doesn't mean it's sustainable in the long term, and that doesn't mean that what you think was the cause of it is what's causing it. It could be a few random nutrients you weren't getting that you're now suddenly getting, and you know your body in some way starts working better. Uh, it could be that you were really deficient in magnesium, and all of a sudden – you're eating tons of greens, which are, yes, their pH is alkaline, but the, it, it might be the specific mineral that you're getting now that you weren't getting that is causing such a big change in your health. Uh, you know, without enough magnesium, there's a whole host of different biological processes that don't function optimally, whether it's detoxification, um, your muscles can't fully relax, and you could be having cramps, etc. So, I'm hesitant to get into any kind of conclusion that, you know, 
uh, especially when it comes to diet, that this one thing is causing all these things. Uh, they base a lot of their ideas on this idea of cancer cells not existing uh, in an alkaline environment. But if you have stomach cancer, uh, it's the stomach cancer isn't there because your stomach has acid in it. Your stomach needs to have acid in it. Different parts of the body uh, have different pHs. And to try and think that you can only take in nutrients that are within one range of pH is going to lead to problems because then you're just not getting the foods that have other minerals in them that would be more acidic because minerals can exist along the spectrum of pH as well. So right. it could it could be easily translated that if you're needing alkaline foods, you're just needing those alkaline minerals and there's way, different ways to get those. And if you only start getting those, you're going to end up deficient in the minerals that are considered acidic. So it's, it's about balance. Yeah. I think I heard in one of your videos, um, or maybe it's just from my personal research, but that you can alter your pH just by breathing, you know, breathing out carbon dioxide. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That will shift it a bit. Uh, I mean, (laughs) that's if it, if you're thinking purely on pH, it'll change it. But if you're actually deficient in alkaline minerals, you obviously need alkaline minerals from foods, but yeah, breathing will start to shift it. uh, So this is, so there's a big problem then come from, soil not being mineralized like are we purposely being weakened by wherever the powers that be and there's a lot of conspiracy <laughs> theories out there but if the top soil is completely not you know it's in terms of mineral deficient. abundance it's completely deficient compared to where it was 100 years ago like we're being starved to death what's your take on that oh well, that's totally true that soil is very deficient um there's all sorts of practices that aren't continue today like proper crop rotation um you know when you put in npk fertilizer and you don't put on enough manure or other things that were originally done you end up with more deficient uh, agriculture and monocrops um a big thing that all uh, both post yeah all post agricultural societies did before they got too far along would is they spread ashes from their cooking fires on their fields and on their vegetable gardens and things like that. And wood ash is extremely concentrated in minerals because if you think of a, a tree, the how much minerals it pulls up in its lifetime and how deep the roots go, it concentrates all those minerals in its uh, wood. And when you burn that, you're burning away all the fiber and carbon, and then you're left with... Uh, the super concentrated minerals. And then if you were to spread those out on your garden, that is one way you can get very mineral rich soil. And there's actually, um, people like Dr. Joel Wallach have, uh, kind of done some research on this, that almost every indigenous culture had the practice of consuming wood ash where they'd mix, um, for example, in indigenous Americans, bannock, which is kind of like this red thing they would make over a fire they'd mix approximately one third of all the flour that was used in it was wood ash. I mean, any more of that, I'm sure it wouldn't taste so good, but um, that's kind of like a, that was like the indigenous people's mineral supplement. Then you also have people that would eat clay cultures that would do that. So there's all, all sorts of odd ways our ancestors got a lot of minerals that we don't actually explore today. Well, it's even with like animals, like when you go camping and after a fire, like you'd look out, you know, in the morning, at the campsite or the fireside and you'd see like squirrels like gorging themselves of the ash. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Like That's I've seen that before. Like they're detoxing themselves probably <laughs> from the food humans gave them or something. <laughs> yeah. The M&Ms or something. <laughs> <laughs> Goblin M&Ms. But, um, uh, so jumping from that, uh, what would you say is the best remineralization strategy people can, you know, empower themselves with them. I'm actually looking into a strategy of uh, taking Sheila G pit, like pitch, like the mm-hmm. actual tar. Mm-hmm. Like, what would you, what would be your experience with that? Yeah. I mean, all, a lot of those products are great. There's a, a lot of different types of ancient minerals where they're, there's like uh, sort of super concentrated and compressed plant and animal compounds within pitch. Um, I, I've been actually talking about that recently um, there's some products I take that have that in it, uh, sort of a, yeah, it's described as a mineral pitch and, or shale. And what's happened is the minerals haven't fully converted back to uh, inorganic yet. So with minerals, you can have 
calcium that's from a rock and then you can have calcium from a plant and they're both called calcium, but one is actually missing an extra carbon atom. And what happens in soil is that a plant has bacteria that it lives symbiotically with in its roots. And the, that bacteria can adds a, this extra atom to the mineral. And then the plant's actually able to use it. So people often say, well, plants turn inorganic minerals to organic, but it's actually the bacteria on the plant. And so once the plant has absorbed that mineral that's now colloidal or it's now um, organic, then animals or other, or I guess uh, fungus as well, can consume it if the plant dies or gets eaten. And we're then able to use that thanks to the plant and the bacteria converting it. Yeah, so, like a circle of life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, ways that you can, I guess, get more minerals. Uh, these products are another one. Uh, if you have your own garden, putting wood ash on it is a great way. Um, you hear a lot of people talking about putting uh, stone dust or um, seaweed extracts into their soil. There's a lot of different ways to I increase think Matt the... was even watering his uh, trees at uh, his parents' house with... Uh... Ocean water. ocean water, yeah, just straight ocean water. Because I heard about that from David Wolf, and the trees were doing really bad. And then it did take a while of doing that, but now they just produce like crazy at my parents' house. It's pretty cool. Well, thanks for listening. If you want to check out the full thing, definitely check out their podcast. Check out the Facebook page to see what they're about. They have some other interviews there with some uh, health uh, teachers. And also check out the link below if you're interested in Beyond Tangy Tangerine. You can find out more information there. It contains some colloidal trace minerals that we talked about at the end of the segment there, and it's very nutrient dense, and you're also getting a hit of those trace minerals that keeps you from becoming deficient in them. So with that, I'll talk to you next time. Take care and embrace life without limits.